for, for me, I think sometimes players need guidance and I think they need direction. Um, but also you need to give them the license to ask questions. And um, I'm very much a, a, a manager or coach that likes to be honest and open. Um, and if there's certain aspects to the game that need to be improved, then I think it's only fair that you tell the players or give them a rationale wise to, to maybe you've made a ch tactical change or, or, or personnel change. And uh, I think I'd like to think that I'm honest and open. Welcome to Leave No Doubt. I'm joined by Weymouth manager Brian Stock. Stocky, thank you for being here. Pleasure. All good? How are you feeling? Yeah, all good, yeah. Yeah, yeah, not too bad, thank you. Uh, let's get into it, mate, straight away. I wanted to, I want to start with a conversation about football intelligence, something that I've not really spoken to uh, any other player about. The reason why I'm going to start talking about it with you is because, obviously, having known you as a player, it's something that you really stood out as having a lot of um, so really I want to ask you, what is football intelligence? And in your opinion, how important is it to have that in the modern game? I think my earliest memory of that, Joe, probably comes from when I was in the youth team and I had Sean O'Driscoll as a manager. Um, he, he coached in a totally different way, um, very much thinking outside the box. And he gave us players the licence when we crossed that white line to make our own decisions and then educate obviously uh, post-match so he um he certainly for for, for my type of player uh, and and the fact that I wanted to um, get on the ball uh, make things tick uh, be creative with my with, with my football intelligence and sometimes it, it certainly comes from the coach giving you that license to try things um, and you know I had Sean as a coach for my youth team and then uh, as I broke into the first team at Bournemouth and then uh, I followed him to Doncaster Rovers. So I, I played quite a lot of my football under him. And when you look at the likes of myself, uh, Carl Fletcher, Eddie Howe, Jason Tindall, Stephen Purchase, um, all guys that have come through his guidance and now uh, obviously having um, successful coaching or managerial careers. Can you give us more of an insight into what those sort of training sessions looked like? I mean, I was a, a youth team player probably at the back end of Sean O'Driscoll's um, journey here, Bournemouth. And to me, at that age, I was, you know, I couldn't um, understand what was going on, obviously, but you'd experienced for a, for a long time. Yeah, and, and we had we had quite a lot of players that would come to the club, especially trialists, and they, they would never have been introduced to, to the way that we would think. Um, that, that would be anything from a warm-up session, um, how we'd be drilled and organised and, and, and let the players work things out and if things didn't work out, he wouldn't give you the answers, you'd have to try and work them out. And sometimes that communication between us and new players or new trialists, uh, that became like sort of almost common knowledge with us knowing that we needed to help them. Um, and there might be times where that would reflect in a game of football where we need to find the answers and, and we need to find the answers as a team. And sometimes we would come up with maybe one or two things that would maybe change the formation or change the tactics or, you know, we'd maybe c consider speaking to the manager um, and almost make decisions. And, and the way that we wanted to play our football, I, I've not necessarily myself certainly seen that type of football played ever, before, you know, since really. And it was, it was a team, um, particularly at Doncaster Rovers, where we played free flow and attacking football. Um, and the, probably the one thing he did concentrate on was, which was set in stone was, what we did when we didn't have the ball um, and that really gave us a platform to to then express ourselves with the ball um, certain things in training he would he would, wouldn't necessarily say I'm obviously I'm a central midfield player but he he might focus on um, fullbacks um, and he'd have players you know representing fullbacks in, in his training session and it gave us an understanding of what might that look for a fullback or if he was a defender, whatever the position might be, you know, he gave an all-round education um, in formations, you name it, so that if we needed to flip formation or if we had a player out or someone had to fill in, um, you know, we, we had that education. So for you specifically, 
before having worked with him, had you any understanding of what football intelligence was? No, not really. I think it, that probably came later on in my career when I had other managers who maybe solely focused on the 11 that would walk out on the pitch and um, if you didn't do it or if you weren't doing your job, you'd be out of the team and, the, and someone else would walk in and sometimes you wouldn't necessarily get the answers to, to why you've been left out of the team. And uh, With Sean, I, I, and I keep going on about Sean, but he was a, a pivotal role in, my, in, in what my career was, would look like and we would focus on even analysis before and after we'd get into groups, we'd get into units, we, you know, this is all coming into play. And uh, even though sometimes I would go away to international duty and we wouldn't even have that um, an analysis sort of in depth um, it, as to what Sean would put in and, and the team would put in. So um, I, I do think he was way ahead of his time. I really do. A lot of the stuff, the way he got, got us to think, was a really, really good education at such a young age for myself. And in your role now, obviously, as a manager, do you think the manager telling it or asking or educating his players to be intelligent is really important? Or do you think there's a way that people can develop their football intelligence without a manager who promotes that? Yeah, I think there's, for, for me, I think sometimes players need guidance and I think they need direction. Um, but also you need to give them the licence to ask questions and... Um, I'm very much uh, a, a manager or coach that likes to be honest and open um, and if there's certain aspects to the game that need to be improved then I think it's only fair that you tell the players or give them a rationale wise to, to maybe you've made a ch tactical change or, or, or personnel change and uh, I think I'd like to think that I'm honest and open um, and I think if you're like that as a manager I think you allow the players to make mistakes um, if they make too many mistakes, obviously there comes a point where you have to say, look, you know, you, you, this can't happen anymore um, because it's a detrimental effect to the team. And as long as players understand what the manager wants, I think if you give them that free flow and attacking creativity flair, especially in the final third, um, to go and express themselves, knowing that they've, they're not going to get shouted at by the manager for trying to be creative, I think that gives them the platform then to go and express themselves. Is there, so obviously, for people who don't know, obviously listeners, um, when you played as in that centre midfield role, you read the game incredibly well, you were super talented on the ball. Was there anything you were doing away from the manager that was helping you to develop this? And what I mean by that is, when guys aren't at football, can they develop this intelligence by watching the game? I, I think that's probably, you've hit the nail on the head there, I think. Quite a lot of what I'd done away from the football was probably, and at a young age as well, was was watch videos, players in your position, um, how that might look like in, in terms of what uh, your own football team or teammates might, uh, you know, happen on a daily basis. Um, I remember looking at Paul Scholes and the way that he, he moved the ball so quickly, one touch, two touch, uh, aspire to be like him, um, obviously nowhere near his levels, but... Um, like I said, is a player that I, would, I aspire to be, and I think if you if you look back on your analysis of of your game, ask yourself questions: What can I do differently? Um, if you're unsure about something, you know, go to the coach, go to the manager, ask for feedback, do it in the right way. Um, I, I think it's important that players ask questions rather than keep that inside, because if you never ask the questions, you never have the answers and have the freedom to go and, like I said before, express yourself. Do you think there's a difference in, I don't know, you've seen different levels, obviously you've played in the championship, you've been promoted out of League One, you ended up obviously dropping out into the, the National League. Do you think there's a difference in the levels with football intelligence? And the reason why I ask that is if guys are looking to improve and they're looking to um, go up the leagues and move into higher clubs, do they need to be intelligent to do that? Yes and no. I think there's, there's de definitely a... Uh, an aspect to be intelligent. I, what I found um, when I left Burnley, uh, one or two hiccups along the journey, which led led me to sort of moving back down south and and joining Havert and Waterlooville, which turned out to be actually more successful and, and and enjoyable than I expected. But I felt going from a championship promotion side to then playing football in uh, National League South, I, I think a lot of players. The higher you go, they're more proactive, they're on the move, 
Um, if they don't necessarily get the ball, you know, they're constantly on the move, creating space for others. Whereas I felt that when I went down the lower leagues, and especially for, for a midfielder like myself that would probably like to play one or two touch football, I was finding myself that I was taking a touch and then the play would move. Um, I, I'd say that was probably the, the biggest difference. But then the aspect of that is that the contact time that you're with at a club like Burnley every single day to then only going two times a week. So that's tough. And, and for, for, for players and teams to get that cohesion uh, to understand where to be, you know, uh, uh, James Hayter springs to mind because I, I linked up with James at three different clubs and he was always in a place at the right time, uh, whether that be scoring a goal or for me playing in behind, he'd recognise where the space was and nine times out of ten I'd, I, I would have that relationship with James Hayter where I knew he would, where he would be and when you sort of come away from that, it's difficult, you know, but it's, it's, it's trying to adapt, trying to adapt with different teams, different managers, formations, even pitches. I've gone from wearing old football boots um, for, for probably two or three years to then having to buy a pair of studs, you know, but that's, that, that's what, you know, the pitch determines. So loads of different aspects, but I think if your attitude's spot on uh, and you can understand what you know the, the reasons why the team might play that way or why you haven't done that way I think that's the key I want to try and break it down a little bit more what you're talking about because obviously guys at higher levels won't maybe listen to this podcast to improve you know they're at that level for a reason hopefully the guys who are at non-league level listen to this and can take something from what you're saying so the two nights a week obviously a lot of people are playing part-time football is that enough for them to develop and improve and if not what in your opinion might they be doing to help themselves and then we're talking about football intelligence still okay um well i, I mean on behalf of of weymouth football club where i'm currently at the moment we 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 understood that we we needed more contact time um whether that covers football intelligence it probably does in the background because we're constantly having contact time um, the players are uh Having going from last year having sort of seven or eight players to this year having 17 players on a Wednesday session. So for us, we've increased that contact time, which will only help in terms of football intelligence. Um, I think having a platform to be able to view your, your own footage back, um, we, we have the pleasure of that um, with a platform called Huddle, where players have their own logins, can, can go in, can see their own performances, um, opposition, that sort of thing. But I think if you look back on that and think to yourself, you know, I could have done that better or I could have been in that position. Um, but then does that dictate what it might look like as a team? So again, it's maybe something that you could do in terms of writing down questions for the manager, for the coach and say, look, if I'd have done this differently, how would this affect the team? Or how how could I get um, my wide player on the ball or my 10 on the ball? Um, those are the sort of things. I think having an identity with a team or, the, or that you're playing in as well will help because if you're a team that wants to play direct, you know, how does that affect me as a defender? Or if you're a footballing team, that how can I get those players on the ball? How can I get, gain space and, and time? But I think if you identify that, if you ask the manager, coach that, I think that'll help. What, in your opinion, can guys do in their own spare time away from training? Because I understand as a manager, you want more contact time with the players, but for the majority of their daily week, they're not in your presence, they're not being given your, you know, they're not conversing with you. How can guys obviously leave the football environment and still develop? I mean, again, talking on behalf of, of our of our squad, um, we've inherited a good bunch of lads. Um, two weeks ago, we had a Wednesday session where we felt it was more beneficial for the lads to have a day off, given the, the demands of what we went through the previous week. And yet, I'd say probably six, seven, maybe even eight players were off doing their own thing. Um, whether it's at a local park, getting together, working on a bit of sharpness, um, maybe some more individual aspects might be heading that we've not covered for the week, understanding what you might need to do to prepare yourself for the, for the game. I mean, it seems as if you've created that culture here at Weymouth where guys obviously want to improve, they want to learn collectively. If for whatever reason, I know it, obviously at that non-league level that you've experienced, there are some players who want to do that and there's probably a lot of players who might not want to. How can the guys who want to do that in an environment where not everybody's buying into it manage to improve? 
I think it's that definitely comes down to the individual, and I think sometimes players have that perception of if the if the group aren't doing it, why do why, why should I do it? And I think if they can see past that and understand that you're doing everything you can, whether that might be gym work to be as strong as you can, whether that's fitness work so that if you do get called upon or, you know, the, the game's demands on, on the physicality and, and, and the running is, is getting, you know, heightened every single season. Um, sports science is coming into play now. So you're looking at the distance and high speed running, all those sort of aspects that come into the game, and um, something that not necessarily was I introduced to, especially early part of my career, but um, certainly to the latter part of my career, it was it was a main focus um, at, at certain football clubs where, you know, sometimes even team selection would would be based on how far you run. Um, personally, that wasn't necessarily my ethos, and it isn't my ethos here, but it's a marker of. Of, of, of Navy players not necessarily hiding within training or games um, maybe doing that a little bit extra and it's a it comes into sort of almost like key performance indicators so that we know that when our fullbacks um, are coming into a game situation they know they need to hit a certain amount of high speed running because they're a key to, to how we want to play and you know that that, that that education now we can can be transferred from player uh, sorry from manager to player even more so now um, but it all goes back down to sort of the player understanding, asking questions. You've lived in a or played in an era of football where probably at the start the word busy was used as a bad thing, and if anybody was seen to do extra or go beyond what was what was being asked of them, that was you know that was ridiculed by their teammates or or whoever. Whereas now in modern day football, being busy is is almost the bare minimum. Like you, you can't get away with if you want to be successful without being busy. Um, is that something that you saw change as you were playing and obviously now working in, in going into your coaching roles? I think most definitely. I think pre-season was deemed to be do what you want through the summer and then we'll, we, we, you know you lose your body fat through pre-season. I think at every level now, um, I think players look after themselves even in the off-season. I do think it's important that you have downtime because I think it's especially the higher you go the demands and the intensity and the mentality is, is so heightened that you do need to have a break but even players still look after themselves now and um, I think it's you know definitely pivotal in, in terms of trying to hit the ground running uh, I know clubs were you know back in the day they're really curious about giving you so much time off but um, I think I think clubs are a little bit more relaxed on that now because they know that players look after themselves and I think, especially in, in, in particularly with our lot, you know, the players have come back fit, strong, um, almost ready to hit the ground running. So sometimes <laughs> pre-season was probably one week, two weeks of building yourself up. Now you could probably do that after two or three days. As a player, you know, I'm going to touch on it again. You've not only achieved success, you know, you've achieved numerous promotions. You've played at a high level for a long period of time. Um, obviously the Premier being promoted to the Premier League with Burnley sticks out in my mind. But you've also been around top elite players, guys who've obviously gone on to, to play in their national teams and, and at the you know at the top of the Premier League for a long time. What do you think it was about you and these other guys that allowed you to be so successful during that period of time? Mentality. And I think it's easy to say the word mentality because uh, it covers such a broad spectrum and... There's so many ups and downs as a footballer. There's so many disappointments um, that can come from anything from injuries to suspensions to finding yourself out of the team and somebody coming in and taking your place, um, dealing with that, dealing with new players coming into the club. Um, a, a whole variety of things. And if, if the mentality is there to, to take the rough with the smooth, then I think you, you learn to deal with the highs and the lows a lot better. And I think given, given the fact that those disappointments can affect performance. I think if you can understand what it needs to take to be able to overcome that, um, improve yourself as a player. And, you know, I, I, I've seen it from quite a few players where they've been very, very talented. And, you know, that's just that little piece of mentality, that understanding of being left out of the team, what it needs to do outside of the game. Um, what, what do you need to do in training? Do you need to do that little bit of extra running to make sure that you're called upon, you're ready to go? Um, I've seen a lot of players, 
you know, fall short on that. And uh, the ones that have the long careers, the ones that play for 20 years, are the ones that uh, have that strong mentality. You said mentality, obviously, really quickly then. How did you develop your mentality? Can you remember any moments when you were, you, when you were young where that was challenged? Yeah, 100%. And I think uh, as a youth team player, um, it took me a long time to understand uh, what it took. And I, I, again, I was fortunate enough to have Sean O'Driscoll that stuck by me. I signed a long-term contract of nearly five years um, with Bournemouth at a young age and Mel Major was my manager at the time and it took me a, a while to understand what it took to become a footballer but I think because I had the longevity of my contract it, it gave me time um, although that could have been cut short given some, some of my behaviours along the way but um, I think I, you need to learn quick because you know there's so many players out there um, that are willing to take your opportunity to, to play in that team and if, you're, if your attitude's not spot on day in, day out, whether that's a, a training session, whatever it might be, whether that's a sub. I, I, and I revert back to a, a, a comment with, again, with Sean O'Driscoll. He seems to be the topic of my conversation, but again, a major part of my education is that even as, as little as being a substitute, making sure you're, you're the best sub. So that's prepared to, to, with, your, with your shin pads on, you're warm, you're ready, you understand um, set pieces, your roles, you maybe have sort of done a little bit of homework on where you might come on in the pitch so that when you do come onto the pitch, you're ready. And again, I see so many times that I've had it myself when I turn to a sub and, and you know, he's not warmed up and I, and, I, and I don't put the sub on or he hasn't got his pads on and, I, and, and, and he's just not ready. I'll have him instead because he's ready and he's prepared to go on and make an impact. There's a lot of pressure, I think, now on young players especially as we see so often, ah, oh, this 16-year-old's made his debut, or this 17-year-old has made his debut. Guys are making debuts at such a young age now that if you're getting to 18, 19 and haven't had a first-team experience, people are now questioning, like, oh, is this for me? Or Footballers are sensitive these days, as, you, as you've said. Like it's, how important do you think it is to realise really early that I need to develop thick skin if I'm going to be successful? Really important. And... Sometimes when, when players, and I've seen it, uh, again, um, it's particularly in management because you deal with contracts and, and, and negotiations and you see players uh, from Premier League clubs on mega money. And, you know, I, I, I've seen it where players will be released and they'll be going from thousands a week to trying to find a contract. And that contract might even be two, three, four hundred quid a week, whatever, whatever the figures might be. But the, the golf in wages from what that comes down to, is, is it, again, is a tough one to take. Um, people don't understand uh, you know, how, how tough that can be on young players. And sometimes those players might have made their debut for, for first team football um, in the Premier League and they find themselves at the club a year later. Uh, again, mental health is, is so important in this game and it's un important to understand that and recognise that as clubs and as managers and um, it's easy to say oh you need to have a strong mentality but that needs to be educated that needs to that needs to come from 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 the manager from maybe you know a psychologist to understand how can we build that mental health how can we understand what it takes to to, to, to build that thick skin and if we do get left out of the team how do I react in that way it's easy easy enough to throw your toys out of pram because you think you should play but Know, what would it look like as a manager's point of view? And if you see a player react in a positive way, doing extra in training, um, maybe even if as little as shaking hands with players that are in your position to say, look, all the best, I'm here as a teammate, but ultimately I still want your place. But from the outside looking in, we want to do well as a team. And I think that's, again, a major part of, of what I want to create in, in terms of the environment at this club. I mean, your experience as a player and now moving into management would you say then that the psychology of football outweighs physical and technical attributes or, or would you put them on a par with each other? Again, I think that reflects in different positions in the pitch. Um, I, I think it's in, important to understand and recognise uh, that as an individual. And I think if a player can have that relationship with a manager and, and, and vice versa to understand... You know, uh, I think I use a striker as a great example. Uh, obviously, they're there to score goals, uh, simple as. And 
if they're not scoring goals, how can I support that? Because he might be working really hard for the team, but you know, confidence might be low. But if I leave him out of the team, how does that affect that player? Uh, have I lost that player? These are the sort of questions you need to ask yourself. But if I go to him and I say to him, look, you know, I'm going to bring you out of the team for, for this reason or, or, or I'm going to keep you in the team and, and, you know, just keep going, keep shooting. I've still got belief in you. And instill that in the player and, and give him a rationale to whatever your decision might be. If you leave him out and you don't tell him why, then, you know, what's that player thinking? So I think it's important that as a coach, as a manager, and even as a player to recognise that and ask questions and have to try and build that relationship. And I know not all relationships will be the same. Some people will fall away from the wayside or players will leave and players will come and go. Um, but I think that'll be key. Being effective is something I quite like to talk about with, especially obviously at Bromley at the moment, we've got a couple of really talented young players who at the age of 18, 19, want to do everything amazing, but they can't. It's obviously not possible. When you were at a young age, you found how how you could be effective pretty early. You know, you understood your game and off the back of that, you were, you know, you were ultimately really successful. How can... How important is it and how can young guys now realise what they're effective at and use that to obviously progress in the game instead of trying to do everything at once? Yeah, it's a good question because I'm, I'm, I'm actually currently going through that with, with one or two of the players in, in my team at the moment and, and, uh, and I think it's important that they recognise what is their key performance indicator. Um, certain areas of the pitch for certain central midfield players, especially the higher you go, you need to be quicker on the ball, you need to take less touches. And then if we break lines of our passing and we get it to players in between the lines or in wide areas and you give them the freedom to then go and express yourselves, then I think they understand that. And if you don't tell them that and they keep giving the ball away time and time again, you as a coach or as a manager you need to recognise that. And I think as players, if they can do that as well, if they can ask the questions and maybe go to a manager and say, look, what is it you want from me? You know, do you want me to score goals? Do you want me to get in this position? You know, what? How can I affect the team? How can I affect my individual performance? Some of the guys, I've written down some of the names of guys that you've played with that have obviously gone on to play top, top level. So guys like Danny Ings, um, Billy Sharp and Kieran Trippier are just three of, of probably many that have obviously gone on to play at the top level. Those three guys really stand out. Is there anything that those guys were doing or that you noticed about them because you played with Danny and uh, Kieran Trippier before they were playing at the top of the Premier League? Was there anything that you saw in them that, you know, that basically you saw as being why they were allowed to, to go on and reach the heights that they have done? There comes a point when, when talent takes over and Danny Ings and Kieran Trippier very, very talented players with the ball. And, you know, they had a platform at Burnley and they had direction. And when you look at the quality that Kieran Trippier had with the ball um, in wide areas, even at full-back areas, playing in behind, which is what, which, which was a key um, a key pass that, that Burnley were really effective with in behind. Um, you know, his consistency was excellent. And, you know, uh, uh, Danny Ings' attitude, absolutely spot on. And again, a talented player, very, very talented player. Um, it, it was no surprise given the talent that they had, they went on to bigger and better things when I was playing with them as teammates. Um, in terms of attitude, yeah, Danny Ings had it in abundance. Kieran Trippier learned quickly. Um, but, but like I said, I think I'll go back to, to my my original comment and say that they were almost destined to play higher because of, of, of uh, how much quality they had individually. Touching back on you, mate, this summer I spent a bit of time with, with Lee Bradbury on a golf course, um, you know, discussing all sorts, discussing different players in his time, obviously, as Havant manager. Um, and he said, when we spoke about you, he said you were his best ever signing by a mile, is what he said. I'm interested to know, obviously, like you've touched on, you go from a promoted Burnley team who going into the Premier League to, to a Havant set up. Um, what were the immediate differences between the two levels? Because on the opposite side of that, obviously a lot of guys at non-league level now are going to aspire to play at, at, at that high level that you did. What are the obvious differences and what are guys at those lower levels, what do they have to do to match up what the top guys are doing? 
I mean, when I left Burnley, you know, there was a, a part of me that was a little bit depressed. Uh, one or two things um, didn't, you know, fell through. Um, I, I'd, I'd agreed to join a club, um, shook hands, that, that that fell through. And on the basis of that, I also turned down uh, probably three or four other football league clubs. Um, so at this point in time, family come first and I had three children at the time and I had to put them before me and, and my career. They'd supported me for such a long time that it, I felt that it was, it was a time that I had to pay a little bit back and we moved back to, to the South Coast and um, I joined Haven Waterlooville and, and I missed out on a pre-season and I think that's probably, although no one likes to do a pre-season and run, it really does set you up for the season and... I missed out on that, and I felt that my first year at Havant on Waterloo was was filled with frustration. Um, I remember getting sent off a few times, yellow cards, um, and that was purely down to a not being fit enough and, and frustration. Um, players winding me up from the opposition, managers, referees, decisions, inconsistency, pitches, all the things went into the mix, and and it took me um, quite a while to adapt and. And when I understood that it was never going to be the perfect game that I was used to at Burnley on nice pitches and, and, and we're going to play free-flowing football. And it might have to be like a roll of sleeves up, maybe fight to, 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 to then earn the right to try and play. That, that you know, These are the sort of things that I had, I had to learn even at the age of, uh, of, I think I was around about 32, 34. 2014, I left Burnley. Um, so... Once I grasped that and understood what it took, um, worked hard as a manager, and I think the biggest thing for me, which is why probably Lee Bradbury made that comment, was the fact that I want, I never wanted a manager or a player to speak bad of me, and I never wanted to leave um, my career on a downer. So setting standards in training day in, day out was probably my my biggest thing. Um, and I do believe that those experienced players, if they do get to that level... And they don't set those standards. It gives everyone an excuse to lower theirs. And I think after the initial disappointment of relegation at Haven and then going double promotion, that was certainly part of my mindset. Uh, and I think that rubbed off uh, on all the team and we had a group of players all, all pushing in the right direction. That first season that you've just obviously give us an, uh, given us an insight into there about how you felt, it's probably quite common, obviously, with a lot of guys that, that are playing at that level. Um, certainly frustration and I, you know I see it a lot of, of guys who have different perceptions of themselves and when you watch games and when you see obviously people that you're playing against that attitude of frustration is, is quite common how challenging was it for you that year obviously to to get your head around what, what you know the level that you were at obviously off the back of what you were used to um, and how in your opinion can guys who are feeling similar similar stuff get over that yeah, I, I mean, my frustration w was taken out on, on other players and, and a lot of stuff never necessarily gets picked up. The protection isn't isn't as, as heightened as it is in, in, in the championship when you've got cameras watching you and you can look back on that and uh, the protection isn't the same. Um, so I, I almost took the bait from some of the players. Uh, I'm not afraid to admit that, but trying to deal with that frustration... It does come with, with experience, and I think sometimes that does get the better of younger players. Um, it, it's just how you channel uh, channel that frustration and, and, and understanding what, from the outside looking in, how would that look from somebody that might even be coming to watch you play. Uh, I know when I go to watch football games and, and people make a mistake, um, it's how they react. And and I'm, I'm, a, I'm a manager and a, and a coach that's huge on transitions. Um, and, and if our transitions in our team aren't good enough then you know we become an open team and when I look at players and I look at how they react to, to certain mistakes you know if, if that's an instant reaction that they're going to go and win the ball back they forget the mistake or supporters forget the mistake and then funny enough they'll clap they'll clap the, the player for going to go and make a challenge when realistically they're giving the ball away under no pressure it, it, you know it sounds weird but it, it's everything that a manager wants to see in a player and even a teammate and even a supporter wants to see that that, that endeavour that, that that attitude to go and do whatever you can to either rectify that, that mistake. You saw the difference in level really quickly. Is training at an elite level, and I'm talking about obviously the, the top of the championship, Premier League, attainable for guys at these lower leagues? 
most definitely. And I think the, the reason why I say that is because, especially when you come to the back end of your career, I found it tough at Burnley to, to sort of almost keep up at the levels uh, of some of the younger players coming through. And I've, I've been fortunate enough to see from a number of different levels as a player, um, definitely a number of different levels as a coach, even from the, from the youth all the way up. And, and obviously being in that uh, AFC Bournemouth environment, having the pleasure to see the 23s, 18s and first team. So I've seen, I've seen quite a lot of football on, on that side of things. And, and, and when I've come into Weymouth and we have trialists come in, you know, some of those trialists are out running players that are already in, in our squad. You know, we had a, we had a trialist the other day that is running way ahead of, of, um, of some of our so-called fitter players. And, um, you know, like I said at the start, I'm not, I'm not a manager that, it's solely about how far you run, but it's a, like I said, it's an indicator. It's in certainly in, in certain areas of the pitch, and um, for any player that uh, that's looking to try and progress their career, trying to sort of improve, trying to get into that full time environment, if they can do all they can so that they're prepared to hit the ground running, whether that be a trial or, or even a, a team taking a chance on a, on a on a transfer, I think if you're prepared to to, to do that and make an impression, that will stand you in good stead. I know you're huge on technically gifted players. Obviously, you look for talent. But how much of a benefit is being fit? I know you've obviously just said that it, it's not all about running. But the talented guys with the ball sometimes, you know, we've both seen it, feel like they probably don't have to do as much. But what is the benefit of being fit? I think it's really important, especially uh, nowadays. I think it's it, it probably was never looked at. Um, back in the day, never really had that GPS, never really looked at the stats and, and, and that much depth. And, and with sports science improving all the time, um, even to, to the lower league clubs as well now, quite a lot of those sort of teams have, have the GPS vests. And um, I, think it's, I think it's really important because it stands out. And I think if you're fit uh, and managers can see that and they can see that you're playing 46 games a season rather than maybe 24, 25, these are the things that go through managers' minds thinking... Well, if I'm going to pay this player this amount of money, what am I going to get back in return? Is he going to be fit for the whole season? And, and I know sometimes you, 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 there there is a an element of being unlucky with injuries, contact injuries, or, or muscle strains, whatever that might be. Um, definitely looking at how many games you can play, and then understanding the reasons. If there was that circumstance, okay, well, you know, can we work with this player? Um, and how many play, how many games are we going to get out of him, and can he train on a basis, regular basis? I think it's something that we've done quite recently. We, we've looked at the percentage of, of of how many players are available to train and how many players are available to play games, particularly in pre season. Is something that we've monitored quite closely, um, and then it might mean that we, now we've got a twenty three, so that we give that that player um, a little bit more time to to maybe gain their minutes in in that. So it's 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 like I said, it's vitally important. Are there obvious differences as you step up each league? Like, so the pair of us, obviously, you're managing and I'm playing in the National League at the moment. Are there obvious differences between League Two, League One, Championship and Premier League? How can guys prepare themselves for that jump if they get there? Yeah, I think, I think in, in particular our league, I think the, the, the work rate is, I don't think there's many teams that can carry players, in particular in our league and and the ones that do carry players, you know, they, they're probably paying them a lot of money uh, a, a week. And the higher you go, um, from 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 the outlook, it probably looks like they're not working hard. But trust me, you know, every single player up and down the country will be working extremely hard. And and, and I, I appreciate the fact you might have one or two luxury players that don't necessarily cover the ground, but those are the ones that are costing a hundred million pound a week. And um, you know, they they they. Like like I said, only certain teams can carry those type of players, and 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 in particularly the lower you go, it's very rarely that work rate and fitness levels and things like that um, are not applied by the manager or the coach. And when we talk about technical things, being able to obviously the contact with the ball, what are the sort of differences we're looking at from you know from technically gifted players when you were obviously that we've spoken about when you were at Burnley to. I haven't what Louisville team. What are the obvious differences with with the technical ability? I think it, it goes down to, to to the manager and what, what how how he wants to play football. Uh, you know, there's, there's, that's not disrespectful to somebody that's not necessarily technically gifted, but somebody might be um, 
an organiser. Somebody might be understanding his strengths and weaknesses. It might be a, a defender that will be an, an excellent defender, first and foremost. Um, but the team might not necessarily want to play out from the back. Um, but he's in that team for that reason and he understands that responsibility. Whereas he might be in a footballing team where that's, that central de defender might not necessarily understand his responsibilities in, turn of, in, in, in trying to play out. But I think whatever the, the, the level, the club, the manager, if you understand what's needed from you, I think that will, like I said before, that will stand you in good stead. Before we move on to, I'm going to ask you some questions from a player's perspective to a manager that I think are quite common that might not really get spoken about, um, to be honest, to put players in a better position to understand how how you might feel. Um, I just want to reflect on your playing career, really, and ask you if there's, is there anything you did or any moments that you had um, that now you're a manager that you think you would have done differently as a player? <laughs> um I'm going to say no because I don't have any regrets. I think every single, whether that be positive or negative, every experience that I've had, I've always, I've always learnt from. And I think, I think especially for lower league players, I think it's important that they, 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 they you know, they understand that if we've lost six nil, why have we lost six nil? Or if we've won five nil, what have I done well to win five nil? And I think if you understand that, and I was always a player that understood. I could probably relive 90 minutes in my head straight away um, because I had that understanding. And, and as soon as somebody said, oh, what about that incident? Oh, yeah, I would remember that. And if I'd need to look back on it, I'd probably go to almost to the minute because I understood as a player when that happened in the game. I don't know whether that's a common thing for players or not, but um, I almost used to relive the game straight away. And it, especially at night time, I would never stop thinking about it. And I'd think, what have I done? Um, as a player individually, I, I knew my strengths and my weaknesses and I knew that I wasn't a player that could take probably more than two or three touches. So I needed to move the ball quick. I needed to be aware. Um, I needed to be brave in, on the ball, always look for the ball, um, but have an understanding of that. If I start to take two or three touches or if I give the ball away, alarm bells would start to ring. Um, that was an indicator for me. So off the back of your playing experiences, what would be your best piece of advice for young players just starting out in the game? Um, my best bit of advice would be talent no doubt gets you spotted and attitude will 100% keep you there and if you have that and talent to match that as well then that will stand you in good stead and I think if they understand that that when not necessary um, you're in the limelight or you're on the pitch because you're getting judged on a Saturday. Um, are you at home? Are you doing everything you can to give yourself the best possible opportunity? Are you going to bed on time? Are you sacrificing going on nights out with your mates? Are you drinking the right stuff? Are you eating the right stuff? Are you fueling at the right time? Are your recovery ready to go again? And if you say, if you can honestly put your hand on your heart and say you've done everything you can, um, then I don't think there's anything more that you can do, especially as a young player. Um, I know that when I was young, I didn't do, I didn't tick all those boxes. I, I suppose I got lucky one or two times. I had a bit of faith kept in me because my, my, I suppose uh, my talent got me spotted. And my attitude wasn't keeping me there. And I had to learn quickly to understand what it took for me to stay at that level and, and improve. And I was fortunate enough to, to have that opportunity to, to rectify one or two mistakes that I made in early in my career and yeah. And really try and give everything I had. And I'm, I'll never forget the car journey going down from Southampton to Bournemouth in my car and, and ha having some motivational music, almost saying to myself, look, I've got to, I've got to make sure I smash this. This has got to be because it's now now or never. Um, you know, and I, I did everything. All right. I lived like a monk for six months. And um, yeah, I did everything I could to give myself the best possible opportunity. I want to dive in on just a little bit of detail you've given us there because I think it might be really refreshing for, for people to hear. When you say your attitude was challenged, what do you mean? What what happened? Um, so uh, I got given a, a basically a three-year deal and a two-year deal. So for, for me, as a young player, 18 years old, thinking I've made it, um, going on nights out, drinking when I shouldn't be drinking, um, not necessarily living my life right. Um, loads of little things getting into trouble. Uh, one or two things that I was, 
uh, you know, I don't mind saying this now because I, I, you know, I got banned from driving and I was coming into training in my car. Um, and these are the things that um, the manager understood. He saw a player in me. He gave me the time. He gave me uh, all the reasons that I was doing wrong. And he tried to put them right. I, I moved from Southampton back into Diggs. Um, I lived in Diggs with with a with a fantastic couple called um, Audrey and Nimbus, um, who really really put me on the straight and narrow. And I know they were responsible for quite a few players for doing that as well. Some big high profile players like Jermaine Defoe, for instance. Um, and I think that gave me a platform then to then say, right, well, my my night's looking. I'm training. I'm coming back home. I'm eating. I'm drinking. I'm drinking the right things, obviously. Um, and the only time I was allowed out of the house was to go to bingo with, with the landlord. So, but it, it was brilliant because I shared those moments with him. And again, I, I was be, I was able to then wake up in the morning and I was good to go to train. Right, so let's get into to your opinions as a manager then just for the, for the benefit of any players watching. Um, I know your opinion is obviously different to, to all the managers, so, so it's pretty unique. But the first thing really I want to ask you quite simply is... What makes players attractive to managers? Um, reactions um, to disappointments or giving the ball away. Um, work rate, without a doubt. Um, I don't, I can't remember a player ever really getting taken on because you know they've, they've got a poor work rate. Uh, I think that stands out. Um, and then obviously it comes down to individual brilliance, but that doesn't necessarily mean that's every position on the pitch. If they're an organiser, if they're vocal, if they're maybe encouraging or maybe giving constructive information to players. Um, but f for me, if I'm watching a game and I'm watching a, uh, an individual in particular, I'm looking at their mannerisms and, 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 and what are they doing necessarily when they haven't got the ball. Um, sometimes players think that that, that limelight's not necessarily on them or the spotlight's not on them. But for, for, for anyone that's watching, especially uh, myself, you'd be looking at every single thing they do, whether that's a recovery run, whether that's a reaction press, whether that's taking a play, whatever it might be, whatever the scenario might, might, might unfold, is how they react to that. Something my parents, or especially my dad, always told me was somebody's every game, somebody's always watching. Whatever you do, someone's always watching. He used to drill it into me so that I would play with that in my mind, like, oh, Yes, I've made a mistake, but like someone's watching me do well the next time, or somebody's watching me do this. How appropriate is that statement? Is somebody always watching? I I agree, and and I think that probably came into my coaching um, more so when I was in the academy at AFC Bournemouth, and and educating the players, the younger players, the under 14s, under 15s, exactly that, like exact. You you spot them with your comment because. Whether that's somebody walking a dog on a field that is the father of someone else who might be a scout, whatever the scenario, you never know what his opinion matters to somebody else. Because even if it's just an opinion to, to, to one other, that, that will spiral, especially in the football game. That, it's a small community in football. And if I'm ever going to sign a player, I don't just sign it off of me just going to watch him. I'll speak to his mates, I'll speak to his, his coaches, previous clubs, um, any teammates. Um, it won't. My, my, my signings will never be just off of what I've seen on, on a football pitch because it's key that they have the right character um, to come into this environment, in particular at Weymouth. But going back to your initial point, I think uh, if, if players have that mindset, I think, they'll do, I think that will stand them in good stead. So how much do players need to understand that they can't just turn it on and off whenever they like. They've got to be on it all the time. If they want to be successful, if they want to move up, if they want to, to, to gain levels and, and achieve success, that obviously somebody always watching is an appropriate comment, but that even when no one's watching, that they've got to be still doing the right stuff. Yeah, spot on. And I think, uh, I think even, even more so when the going gets tough, to, to still stick to those principles, whether that's, doing stuff away from, from, from the training ground or wherever it might be, having that mindset to, to be able to keep going, whether it's the positives or negative, whatever, whatever the scenario might unfold, I think it's important that they, they understand that and, and they stick to those beliefs. 
you've just touched on it there a little bit, uh, obviously having just spoken about it, but can you give us an insight into what the process of trying to sign a player looks like from your perspective? Yeah, I mean, it's been difficult for over the last sort of 12 months with COVID and, and not being able to get into stadiums. So quite a lot of that would be done on, on clips. I, I, I do find that quite a lot of players um, will do something in training on a game knowing that that's going to go in their, in their show reel. Um, I'm fully aware of that. Um, but if we were to sign a player just on, on a show reel, then you know, you, you, you're putting uh, a high risk involved in that transfer, especially the higher you go. Um, everything will go into the mix. Like I said to you, we, we'll look at um, attributes. We'll look at what they're like away from the training ground. I know for a fact that uh, there was a high-profile player that I played with, I won't mention names, that he, that he was all due and all set to sign for another Premier League club and that fell through because of what his home life was like. And he had to really rectify that in order to... Um, either keep his career going or, or get another move off the back of it. And, and you know, he certainly did that. Uh, and like I said, I won't mention names, but he, he's gone on to have a, a fantastic career. But um, I, I do think that that is, is definitely key. I'm glad you've touched on showreels because it's something that I've, I've wanted to ask you for the benefit of everybody watching and listening. Is These days, obviously, in modern-day football, social media is so big. You see a lot of young players now that, feel like social media is mandatory and, and that showing clips of things that they've done is is important. When people put together, obviously, show reels and highlights of what they've done in matches to, to show themselves in a positive light, how much do you see of that as a manager? And, and is that important? Like, if I'm trying to get a trial with you, obviously, at Weymouth, do I need a show reel to be able to show you, look, like I'm capable of doing this before you, you accept me in? Um... I wouldn't say it was it was important. I would say it would help to get that introduction into into the player and the manager. Um, once a player, it, it obviously, if we if we're talking in terms of a player signed at a team and and you put a high a highlight reel of of all the good stuff that you've done the week before, um, and then the following week you have a nightmare, but then if you're exposing yourself to social media, you, you, you know you're exposing yourself to to comments from from the public and. We had we had a scenario last year where a, a, a player played particularly well. In fact, he was man of the match uh, one week, and then the following week had an absolute nightmare. And it was all very well putting your good clips on, but are you going to put your bad clips on the following week? No. The simple the simple answer is no. So, if you are going to do that, if you are going to expose yourself, then you know you need to understand that when when the going gets tough and and not necessarily your performance is, is as high as what it was the previous week. You need to have thick skin and understand that those comments are opinions, but they, they can't affect your performance. The opportunity of a trial is something that's quite relevant now because you know a lot of guys at, at lower levels don't now just get bought or signed for if they want to progress up, up the ladder. People are going to invite them in to train. What's the process of, of a trial? And on top of that, what sort of things are you looking for in a trialist? What what impresses you when guys come in on trial? Yeah, I like this question because as a manager, I see this side more than I, I, I have ever have done. And there's so many agents out there that it, it is frightening and they try and contact you on every single platform going. Um, and you know what? One, what there's, there's, there's one player in particular that stick, sticks out in my mind who messaged me himself and just said, look, this is me. I can send you my CV if you want. Um, just looking for an opportunity. And I, 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 I like that. And I like the fact that he's taking his time out to do that himself rather than rely on an agent because agents just put that out to everywhere. And there's no, there's no, there's no um, what's the word I'm looking for? Sentimental behind it. It's almost like you're just sending it out so just willy-nilly to every single... And if you, get, if you get someone that takes the bait, then happy days. Whereas um, I, I, I really thought, like, you know... Don't get me wrong. The kid sent me his um, his highlight reel, and I thought, yeah, he's got he's got talent, the boy. And the, why not? Let's take a look. Invite him in, and he's keen, absolutely keen. And whatever may happen with him, I don't know. But he's taken the time out himself. Um, the platform was linked in. You know, he he contacted me via that. Um, it's not to say that I'm going to accept loads of uh, 
um, invitations on LinkedIn. But you know, he 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 took he took that process and, and done that himself. And um, like like I said, there's loads of agents out there just um, trying to get all the all the players. Uh, and not to say that's not the, the, the right or wrong, but some, sometimes you need to say that. You know how how are those agents how are those agents approaching managers because sometimes they get just lost in the archives and sometimes that opportunity for a player um, might get lost off the basis of that. I'm not going to suggest that players hide behind agents because you know having a keen interest on on agency myself and and having worked with with a good guy for a long period of time, I know that that might not always be the case. But how comfortable the guys players whoever it may be have to get with trying to reach out to managers and have conversations with managers themselves instead of just expecting that to be done by an agent or by even by a parent or by somebody else on their behalf yeah it's difficult and it's difficult for players to have that first initial contact um trying to get through the gatekeeper is hard um in terms of trying to get into the manager i fully appreciate that and i'll go back to your initial point about agents don't get me wrong, there's some fantastic agents out there that, that really care about the player, that will pick the phone up with the players uh, and be there to support them through the good and the, and the bad times. Um, there's also a lot that aren't. And unfortunately, some players uh, have sort of two or three agents within a, a short space of time because if the agent can't get a club or they don't fight for that player, it's where's the next player? And they don't understand... Um, what's needed, whether that's just the support, whether that's an arm on the shoulder, even if it's the fact that, listen, I'm sorry, but I, I'm, I've tried all I can for this player, but I simply can't get you a club. That, that very, very, very uh, rarely happens. So to just touching on that then, how, so how comfortable do guys need to be with, with approaching? Uh, and we're going to get into it a little bit deeper in terms of the manner in a conversation with a manager, but... Being brave enough, as you just touched on, that you know the guy reached out to you but via LinkedIn, which I'm not promoting that everybody does. But thanks. How um, <laughs> how important is it for for people to be comfortable doing that? Um, yeah, it does. It it takes a brave player to do that because they'll probably be thinking, "What does that manager think?" Um, again, am I am I am I just going to be one of the thousand players that are trying to get a con a, a contract so, or even a trial somewhere? Um, and I'm not saying that's, that that is the way to go. I, I really ain't. Uh, but what I'm saying is that when you ask me that question and, and, I, and, I, and I see a player that wants to try and take care of his own career, I, I admire that. But in the same sentence, how does that look for every single other player out there? Because that's going to be tough for every single player to try and find a trial in, in that sense. Yes, the lad was quite local and, and um, you know, he was he could get to the training quite quite easily but that 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 might not necessarily be the same case as the rest of the players but um trying to find an agent that's good that cares that will do everything you can is probably the key to that something i've heard a lot from from managers that i've obviously worked with over the years and something that i've only really understood the older i've got is managers will say it's not personal and I always never really bought into that when I was young. I thought like, oh, he must not like me for this reason or that reason. If it's not about my, you know, if, if he doesn't like me for my football, then I, I took that personally. I was quite sensitive. Whereas when you get a bit older, obviously, you know your game. is is You are sort of effective, as we've spoken about. You, you become effective. And when a manager says it's not personal, I've only really, truly understood that it's, it's not an attack on somebody's personality. But or an attack on their football, which just for whatever reason you don't see the, the player being of benefit to you in that one particular game, maybe. Um, how much of a true statement for guys, obviously, trying to get an insight into a manager's thoughts, how true of a statement is it's not personal? Well, I can only talk on behalf of myself, obviously, and uh, I can only remember one time last year where I felt that one player really deserved the opportunity to play and I left him out and I'm sure individuals will think differently no doubt because you're never going to keep a squad of 20 25 27 players happy we had to you know obviously last year we had to furlough players and things like that and, and trying to keep a squad happy is tough but when it comes to like being personal I, I'd like to think that if you're honest and open as a manager and then if the player then can understand that and then 
the, the reasons for the manager, if that marries up to what you think as a player, then I think that statement becomes true. Um, I think if a, if a manager says you're not doing this, this and this, but then there is no evidence, then I think that become a, a potential clash between the player and the manager. Um, I think if, if a player can ask those questions and, and ask why, and this, as long as obviously if the manager is approachable um, and, and, and understand, maybe ask the probably the pivotal question is, OK, I respect your decision. What have I got to do to get back into your team? And I think if they ask that and they put that into the position of of the manager, then they say, well, I've done this now. Like, why am I not playing? And then if it becomes personal, then that might be that the time to leave the football club. I don't know. But if you if you do all you can in terms of asking the right questions at the right time, um, on that point, I, if, I, if I announce the team, I like to concentrate on that team and whoever's not necessarily in the team or in the stands have to support that team. If it's a player that I've left out on a Saturday because he's played on a Tuesday and, and I need to give him a reason for it so that I get peak performance out of him on a Saturday, then I will tell him. But sometimes, ultimately, if a player has an issue, I, I find it difficult that a player comes to me straight away because the focus then becomes on the team. And if you're not a team player, you won't be part of my squad. So there is a time and place. I think there's times where to let things settle, you might be heightened, you know, emotions might be running high because you want to play. And I think if we let, sometimes letting the dust settle and then actually having a uh, a conversation about that, I think that will probably sometimes help that might come on a couple of days later. The way you framed the question that you just said there is, is something I wanted to touch on anyway. So, so I'll touch on it now. You said, what can I do to get in the team? Is there a difference between a player saying, what can I do to get in the team and why am I not in the team? Um, I, I definitely think there isn't a difference um, because there comes a point where if you're doing all you can because you've asked that question and you're still not getting that opportunity, then you can maybe back that question up with why. Why am I not in the team? Because you said I need to do this, this and this, yet... I'm still not getting that opportunity. So I do I do think there is two different questions, but I think the timing of them are, 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 are pivotal. And I think if you can ask why you need to do it, because you're not doing the right things that the manager wants, and then as long as you can say, look, I've done this, I've I've come on, I've scored, I've assisted, or I've whatever the, whatever the scenario might dictate, sorry, uh, in terms of um, uh, an individual, then I think you know you have every right to say why. Recently in a conversation with, with Tom Lockyer, I don't know if it will, I won't give it all away, so I'm not sure if it would be released before or after this, but he, when he was a youth team player, he basically had so much anxiety about speaking to his manager, who he felt was being unfair to him at the time, that he questioned whether or not he wanted to continue playing or not. Um, in the end, the conversation that he had with his manager, and that conversation obviously goes into quite a lot of detail, but he said the actual conversation wasn't as bad as what he'd built up in his mind. And as a player, I know obviously in your experience as a player, having a conversation with a manager can make you feel anxious. It can, you know, it, it, that building, building a conversation up in your mind, for me, especially when, since I've been playing, it was always a difficult thing for me that, you know, my, my dad would say, oh, I just go and talk to the manager about it. And then I think, oh, you don't get it. Like it's, talking to the manager is not easy. Like it's, it's not a simple process. Mm. How can players who feel that way get over that feeling and approach a manager to, you know, it might be whatever they want to talk about with that manager, but how can they get over that feeling of feeling anxious about it? Yeah, I, I, I think that's a tough question to answer because I think it all depends on what sort of manager do you have. Um, when I first got my first contract, Mel Machen was a very stern, tough manager to approach and, and I felt exactly the same. And I, although I wasn't with Mel Machen for too long, um, because Sean O'Driscoll took over, um, he invited questions. So he, he had that almost question and answer sort of ethos that he wanted players to ask those questions. So from the age of 15 to the age of 24, I had, I had, a, I had nine years of asking questions and, and what ifs and what can I do better and um, what the feedback that I got from, from Sean as well. Like he was always feeding back to me as a, as a manager. Um, whether that be like a report, we'd have DVDs of the games, uh, you know, whatever whatever that um, scenario might be. But as a manager, I think it's important that 
especially um, for instance, uh, if we're doing a warm up and I'm not necessarily leading the warm up, it's maybe going in, interacting with one or two of the players, putting an arm around the shoulder, um, and engaging with the player rather than the player having to engage with a manager. I think that's important. And um, although you know it's not something that you 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 would do constructively is something that happens sort of almost naturally and sometimes you're not might not necessarily get around that player and he might be feeling left out and he might be feeling um oh well the manager's not spoke to me but he spoke to the other striker who's playing in front of me and he'd be thinking oh well he's going to start on Saturday you know that's a natural feeling to think um, and I think everyone would be lying if they didn't think that but it's it's it's, it's almost trying to can you engage with a manager as well can you because sometimes it won't be done on purpose that but psychologically you'll be thinking that you know so I think it works in both ways I think the manager can be proactive with that and I think also the player just go and ask questions and if you if you don't get the right answers or you know it, th there's no harm because even though you might not necessarily get the right answers the amount of times that players will come to me or even as a player and I see them coming on the bench and then all of a sudden the next subs the player that's kicked up a fuss or actually got knocking on the door that happens quite a lot because you're in the player's mind he knows that you care he wants you want to play those are i think um i think that, that that will definitely help a player to understand the manager and and where he can improve is there a wrong way to approach a manager i think the the the, the, the initial thing for me a wrong way um is not reacting in the right way and and maybe losing a training session because you're sulking and your attitude's not spot on, that sticks out like a sore thumb to me because we had a scenario where that happened last year and he got left out of the squad entirely without even an explanation, and that I didn't feel that deserved an explanation because if you're going to react in that way, then then it's only going to be you that is going to basically. Um, be punished for that on on on, on your own actions. Um, I think if you, it, it, it all depends again on the manager. If you if you ask constructive questions, like I said to you, like well, you know, if you're questioning one or two things at a manager's decision, you, you, you know, you could potentially be stepping over the line on on his authority or his own decisions. But if you understand that what your coach or your manager might dictate, then I think. You know, you ha you have every right, and if you don't get the right answers, then you know psychologically you're in the manager's head as well. A piece of advice that I sometimes give to to young players that I play with when they have the difficult decision: oh, I don't know whether to approach the manager about why I'm not playing, um, and for whatever reason the manager ends up saying, "Look, I like I, I, you're not in the team because of this." My advice to them usually is to include the manager in the process of them trying to learn in the process of them doing their exercise and training because I feel like that will endear the manager towards that player by being involved in the process of them improving. Instead of saying, why aren't I in the team? How can I get in the team? And then involving the manager in that process is much better in my opinion or in my experience as well. Is that true? Or, or Yeah, I think so. Um, I remember, like I said to you, I've had nine years at Bournemouth where I had questions, answers, questions, answers, approachable manager. I then signed for Preston under Billy Davis and I made my debut um, on cloud nine. Honestly, uh, high fives all over the place, going home to my family, everyone celebrating, new contract, sign a five-year deal, absolutely on cloud nine. I come into training on a Monday morning and all the clips were basically on me and what I did wrong. So I've gone from there to, that, to rock bottom straight away. All the players tried to pick me up, don't worry, don't worry, it's this, is this, is this. And then I find myself um, not start one of the games. So I went to the manager and I questioned the manager, um, why am I not playing? Having known that for the nine years, I've always, that's all I've ever done. And, and his response was, don't think you're going to rock up here and, and basically start. You know, you're here under my guidance. And I, I was like, well, that's not what I meant. And I actually wanted to ask, why am I not playing? Um, so he almost put me down again, down here, confidence low, really, really low. Felt I was asking a, a very valid question, but I've walked away feeling low. Now, again, I'll call upon my own experience where I've gone away, gone home, upset, sad, you know, all those sort of emotions running from going from there on cloud nine to, to rock bottom. Um, and I always remember one time walking in from training 
um, it was literally a, a day or two later and Billy Davis comes sprinting over to me and put his arm around me and he said, listen, son, you're going to light this place up soon. Just make sure you keep working hard and showing the right attitude. And it went, honestly, it, the whole weight lifted off my shoulders. And what a fantastic man management, a man manager, uh, Billy Davis was really, really good. Really, really good. Um, and, and he had a really good group of players that he kept happy. And although, although it sounds strange me saying that because he's made me feel rock bottom, he's lifted me back up to a stage where I feel that I'm going to be called upon at any moment. And, you know, it's a really good learning curve for me because, I've, I, I, like I said, I've gone from feeling really, really low and, and through no action on myself, the managers took that upon himself to then pick me back up again. So, again, we touch on with, with players, if for whatever reason they don't get that from a manager, how important is it to be thick-skinned enough that they get themselves through that moment? Yeah, and it comes with courage. And I think that's probably the key word to that because if you can pluck up the courage to go back in and ask questions again, then then hopefully you'll get the right answers. Again, choose the right time to do it. Um, I probably didn't necessarily pick the right time to do that. Uh, and again, I, I will learn and, 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 and react from that as a player. Um, but if you can pluck up the courage to ask valid questions, I think that's key to it. Don't Make sure you're prepared when you're going into that, into that confrontation with a manager because it can be a daunting place. And if you can back up your questions with what it might look like from previous performances or training, an example might be, um, why, did you, why did you bring me off? Um, um, what was the reason for that? Was that a tactical change or was it just a personal change? Did, did I do anything wrong to, to make your decision? Um, and obviously your, then, your, your conversation then becomes a debate on, on, his, resp on his response. Um, and I don't think you ever want to get into a position where you become arguing, but if you come in with, with valid questions and prepared for that, for that confrontation, then I think that will stand you in good stead in terms of where that conversation might head. To finish, mate, to, to leave this fresh in listeners' minds, what are the most important things, in your opinion, all players need to be doing to give themselves the best possible chance of being successful? Yeah, well, I think obviously over the, the course of this, um, we've probably touched on quite a few of those aspects. Um, I think just doing everything you can to be, to be the best you can. Um, never have an off day. Never, never wake up one day and think to yourself, right, well, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm going to take it easy today, or um, I'm not necessarily going to do things right. You know, th these are all the sort of things that when I look back on. You know, I could have probably potentially have done better. I wouldn't say that I ticked those boxes every single session, but the older I got, and I understood that. Um, I think for, for a young player, uh, understanding uh, your point, knowing, knowing that there's always somebody watching, I think that's probably key because I think even if that's a teammate having that respect for that player because he works day in, day out, never has an off day, um, if it might, if it means that that player's career might not necessarily be at that club, again, there's the reference point for somebody else. You know, like I said to you, when I sign a player, I'll, I'll speak to the manager, I'll speak to the assistant manager, I'll speak to like his friends, coaches. Um, I'll look back on the whole of his career. I'll look back at certain games, teammates that might have played against him. I've done that on every single player that I've signed this year, and I think if players can understand that, I think. Um, I think that will give them the best opportunity to, to, to maybe not necessarily happen straight away, but over the course of maybe one, two, three, four, five years. I remember at Bournemouth going to Richo Kelly saying, how's he got a move? How's he got this move? And I'm like 23, 24, and I think I'm playing really well. And, and, it, and if you think it's never going to happen, and then bang, I'm on a plane. I'm either going to Preston, I'm either going to Manchester, I'm either going to Swansea because three clubs have put in a bid for me. And it happened literally a flick of a switch when I didn't ex least expect it. So I think that's probably I think that's probably the biggest thing out of my career. And every single time I had I had moves lined up to go to Southampton, Reading, bags were packed at the front door. Never happened. Never ever happened when I when I when I most expected it. Those moves never happened. And when I when I went to Burnley, I, I thought it was going to happen, but it took ages and ages and ages. And then suddenly I'm in the car going to Burnley because it's they're they're good to go. 
Um, so I think I think that for me as a player aspiring to play at a higher level, um, never underestimate how how much hard work, dedication, and your attitude can get you. Listen, Brian, I've I've admired you for a long time, but uh, you know that was a great conversation, really insightful, and, and um, you know I'm hoping a lot of people are going to learn a lot off the back of it. So thank you very much. Cheers, Joe. Means a lot. I hope you enjoyed the episode with Brian Stock as much as I did. Please remember to subscribe, like and review this show and head to the ePerform website to sign up for world-class football-specific information to improve your game every week for free. I'm Joe Partington. See you soon.